Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Today, myself and Mark are teaching the lesson, Managing in Tough Times. But before we begin and dive into this, let's start, Mark, with a morning prayer. If we can come together, me and my brother Byron, uh, talking about the, the Sabbath lesson, Managing in Tough Times. And we ask that we... Uh, internalize it, we learn from it, we understand your message, we help our audience, help those in our audience understand the way we do, the way you want us to, each one of us, so that we can impart it um, in our lives here on Sabbath and learn from it for the times ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. So today, managing in tough times, what do you think of the world today? The war in Ukraine, yeah. Earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, and that is plural, earthquakes. I think they're up to three now in Turkey. The United States is $31 trillion in debt. It's hard to imagine how much that is. Uh, let's say our current population is 334,233,854, according to Google at least a few days ago. If everyone who's alive in the U.S. were to pay this off equally, it'd be $92,750 each. That includes newborn babies. That is just a massive amount of debt. Um, inflation isn't helping the economy right now. Two banks, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the Signature Bank, just collapsed. Another financial crisis, not huge, not massive, but still big enough to raise concerns. And we've made it through a pandemic, although I wouldn't be surprised if another one's waiting right around the corner. Natural disasters, massive storms, flooding, abnormal weather all around. Ellen White wrote in Prophets and Kings, on page 537, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living, rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women, of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element. And they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Oh boy, I'd love to hear right about today. In our times. Yep. Right. I mean, they had things like, you know, the Spanish flu back then. They had the, the stock market crash and things like that. But everything coming together like it is today seems a little overwhelming exactly. at times. Exactly. Exactly. So, and that was in 1917 she wrote it. So, yeah, that's definitely something. Let's move to our memory verse. Psalms 50, verses 14 and 15. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. So God's word clearly tells us how we can persevere through all these troubling times. This week, we're going to take a look at how to manage them, though, specifically with different situations. On Sunday, we're going to see just how important it is to put God first. No matter what resources we have on this earth and how not trusting in the arm of flesh is so important to being victorious through the trials and tribulations. Monday, we're going to look at how trusting in your own resources can lead to a catastrophe. Even in the world, we see that sometimes it looks like it turns out well, relying on your own resources, but really in the long run, most of the time it doesn't end very well. On Tuesday, we're going to see just how simplifying our lives can significantly help in our walk with God. How we need to put things of the world in proper perspective and make room for God in our lives. Wednesday is all about priorities. Do we have them straight in our lives? Who comes first? How much time do we give? And the perils of getting this wrong. And finally, on Thursday, it's about when nobody can buy or sell. 
how having the lessons learned from the rest of the week, Sunday through Wednesday, are vital to surviving this time and persevering to the end. We can't do it alone. We never could. And what's the verse? I am the vine and you are the branch. You can do nothing without me. And it's Jesus that we need to truly persevere through this. Matthew 6, 32 through 34 tells us, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And that would be your shelter and clothing and all that. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So really that is the key to persevering as well as taking it day by day. Having God carry us through each day. Otherwise, we will never make it to the end. Let's remember that each day is a gift from God and that each day he gives us the breath of life. And always remember that just in case this day or tomorrow is your last day. So let's move on to Sunday's lesson, putting God first. Let's read 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Munites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazan, Hazazon, yeah, that's right, Tamar, which is in Gedi. In other words, that's really the desert. They do have some springs there, but... So who was Jehoshaphat? He was the king of Judah, the son of Asa, who did not walk with the Lord. That was his father, Asa. So what did he do, and what was he like? Second Chronicles 17, 1 and 2 says, Jehoshaphat, his son, then became king in his place, and made his position over Israel firm. He placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had captured. So the first thing we see here is that he fortified the cities in Judah and placed troops there kind of to strengthen and his position as the new king. Almost sounds worldly, doesn't it? But wait, 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 3 through 5 also says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's earlier years and did not seek the ball. So in other words, he followed kind of the footsteps of, of David, King David, and acted, you know, in, in the correct way with the Lord. And in verse 4, it continues, But he sought the God of his fathers and followed his commandments and did not act as Israel did. So the Lord established the kingdom in his control. And all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. Chapter 17 describes a lot of things that he did. I just want to high point or highlight a few of them. In the third year of his reign, he sent out the Levites to teach all the people of Judah the law of the Lord. So not only did he follow the law, but he also wanted the people to follow the law and be right with God. The Philistines paid tribute of silver to him. The Arabians also brought him flocks of 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats as well. And in Judah's all of Judah's valiant warriors totaled 1,140,000. So he had five commanders and they had troops of 300,000, 280,000, 200,000, 180,000, and 180,000. So not only did he fortify the cities and all that, he also has a standing army of 1,140,000 valiant warriors. He is something, huh? So after reading these first two verses above, it looks like Jehoshaphat is ready for this invading horde, right? Let's see what he does. 
Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 through 13 say, Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Now, wait a minute. He has over one million soldiers, and yet he's afraid. Verse 4, so Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord, and they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Verse 5, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O oh Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O oh our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary here for your name, saying, should evil come upon us, or, or the sword, or judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Verse 10, now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. And see how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but your eyes are. Are on, are, but our, our eyes are on you. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Notice the difference between King Uzziah. Do you remember King Uzziah? The Lord blessed him as well, and he ex expanded his empire, and the Philistines paid tribute to him, but he became too proud and wanted to burn incense in the temple and he was struck with leprosy. And then we see King Jehoshaphat here and how the first thing he does is turn to God. A man with a million man army plus, the first thing he does is go to God because he has that humble heart. And how did the Lord respond? Second Chronicles 20, verse 14 through 22. Then in the midst of the assembly, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, the Levite, the sons of Asaph. He said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jerel. You need not fight this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow you go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of Coralites and the sons of the Cor Coralites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. Now they are off to war. Verse 20, they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, and when, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood up and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire, 
And they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord sent ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come to fight Judah. So they were routed. So even though Jehoshaphat has that mighty military army, who's leading it? Exactly. But what people did he put out in front? The choir oh, yeah. and the Levites to praise God. So who leads an army with a choir? So, yes, his military might means nothing because he trusted in the Lord. And the Lord fought the battle. They all showed up just to be spectators. He leads the army with the choir in front. And I don't think I've ever seen that military tactic at West Point, but it works in the Bible. And so what happened after all this? We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 23 through 25. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When Judah came, so bottom line, God turned them all against each other. And nobody had to lift a finger. When Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things, which they took for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because there was so much. That's incredible. It takes you three days to haul the booty away from the battlefield. Even though King Jehoshaphat and Judah technically had the military might to repel this attacking force, it never entered his mind. At least that's what scripture says. What a lesson for us today when if we, even if we have the means to be self-sufficient, to learn to rely on the Lord first and foremost in our lives. Mark, can you tell us Amen. about Monday? Yeah, that was an incredible story. I mean, I know. He was all prepared, he's ready, and didn't have to lift a finger by putting it all in God's hands. Isn't it's God amazing. awesome? It's amazing. Um, we're going to learn about trusting it on your, on, trust God, not in your own resources, and really why. Is it an issue to count your resources? And particularly, why did, was it an issue for King David to count his resources? We're going to dig into that. But we want to start out another story, another story of putting faith in God. And this is David's best friend, uh, Jonathan, and the time when he defeated a whole garrison of Philistines um, when they were camped out and the Philistines were camped out and, and Jonathan went and defeated a whole garrison of these Philistines. And let's read in 1 Samuel 14, verses 6. Where it wasn't just Jonathan, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer. And let's read in this. Then Jonathan said to a young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. They didn't know how many was going to be in this garrison, but a garrison right. is a pretty large yeah. group of, of soldiers. Not something you tackle with one or two people. No, uh, I think so. And, and, but Jonathan did. He said, let's, nothing restrains the Lord. And we read on, on, on whether he was successful, and he was. He was successful in this. In 1 Samuel verses, chapter 14, verses 14, it says, that first slaughter, which Jonathan as an armor bearer made, was about 20 men within about a half an acre of land. So at this time, the Israelites and the Philistines were about to go to war, and this was that first battle, that first skirmish where we see Jonathan trusting in the Lord and succeeding against 20. So with that in mind, um, we come to David and King David, and he is, he's been successful as the king of Israel at this time. But in 1 Chronicles 21 verses 1, we learn pretty much the opposite of what we learned in Monday's lesson, in that David does almost exactly the opposite. He's not coming to war. There's not people coming to war. But let's read what it says. First Chronicles 21, 
verses 1. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel, to count his resources. In fact, if you look at the, the, the original Hebrew word for Satan, it means an enemy or an adversary. And it's used here, and it's used here without the definite article. Although the translation uses Satan most of the time in these translations, it could also just as likely be the work that refers to a human adversary. David was threatened by a military adversary. And instead of consulting with God, like we learned in, on the first lesson, right. he relied on the power of his army. He forgot that, that divine providence, not, more, not mortal strength, was responsible for Israel's victory in battle. In a census... This, this idea of census or numbering, how many counting his soldiers was completely unnecessary. And, and if you talk to his, his, uh, uh, his general, he knew this too. And let's continue on in First Chronicles 21, verses 2 and 3. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they, not all, are they not all my Lord's servants? Then why does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? What is this issue? Well, the issue is, is that specifically, we know that David is has this idea, Satan really imposed him. He's trying to show that he has more soldiers than some other army. He's worried maybe about his, his military might and he wants to make sure about it. But the other one is, is that he's asked for this count. And why is the census such a big deal? At the, in the time of the Old Testament, a census was only provided by dictate from God. In fact, often, um, when a census occurs, everyone that's in the census would have to give a ransom for their life. They would have to give some offering right. to the Lord. And in fact, we see that in Exodus 30, verses 11 through 16, talking about a time where the Lord asked Moses to take a census. And it says here, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. Then you number them, and there be, may be no, and that there may be no plague among them when you number them. This is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, that the half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord, everyone, including among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above, shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. You can, and you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and, it should, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for ourselves. It's an offering. It's a gift offering, a, a ransom that's done. So this is what was typically done. And David says, no, I'm going to do it myself. I'm worried about my current position. I'm going to count. I need to figure out my military might. In 1 Chronicles 21, verses 7 through 10, we, David understands that he has sinned. And God was displeased with this thing before he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to, to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David thus. Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. David sinned. God understands it, but he's gonna, he, he gives David three choices of punishment, a very unique thing. He's going to give him three choices of punishment. And David chose one of them, the one where there was a plague. And let's read about this, um, this, this kind of cause of his sin, you know, the, the result of David's sin. First Chronicles 21, verses 14 and 15. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And the God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. 
And as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. For the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite. Yeah, amazing story. In fact, if you, we talk, we know that David was, you know, he's, he's, a God of, he's a man of God, but also had his faults. And we often think about, you know, a sin like the sin of um, his, for his wife, uh, Bathsheba, 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 you know, and, and the result of murder, and, and that was pretty bad. But if you look at this sin, 70,000 people fell. Right. Because of this, because he did not trust in the Lord. This, yeah. this was pretty, pretty serious. That's here. a lot of blood. Now you know why he couldn't build the temple. <laughs> yeah. The lesson here is that not, no one ever trusted God in vain. Whether you do battle for the Lord, prepare yourself. Yes, you want to prepare well. Um, there was a quote by a British ruler, Oliver Cromwell, um, who was around, lived around the 1600s, who before a battle said to his army, put your trust in God my boys, and keep your powder dry. In other words, do all you can to succeed, but in the end, you have to realize that God is what, who will give you victory. David yeah. only had the trust in God. He did, and he did it for himself. With regards to today, we have, you know, this is with regards to today, the idea is that we don't want to put our faith in our bank accounts or put our faith in government institutions. I mean, we, uh, Byron was talking about the the incredible debt that these things are happening, and people are putting faith in that. But let's not do that. Let's not do that. These are things of man. Focus on getting out of debt where possible and being generous with what we have been given. Uh, there's a, a financial counselor on, on uh, YouTube, David Ramsley. I don't know if you've heard of him. I, I, it's someone that I try to follow, his principles. And his principles make sense. And he often says, save money. He's often, his, his principle is all about saving money and being out of debt. And he says that in Proverbs 22, verses 7, he often recites this, the borrower is the slave to the lender. You know, by being in debt, you know, even mortgage debt, we are um, connected to our bank accounts. We, it tends us to get connected to the banks that hold up the banks, that hold up the governments, that hold up these bank accounts, and the things of man. The story of David that we're talking about him counting his resources also is uh, counting, thinking that that would save him instead of doing the one thing in that relationship with God. That's all that's going to save us. And that was, mm. that's, Tuesday. that's money for us. All right. Thank you, Mark. You're and welcome. Tuesday, let's look at time to simplify. You know, you see people who go on mission trips to places like Fiji, Zimbabwe, or the Dominican Republic, and one testimony that seems that they all have is how little the people there possess, and yet how happy they are. Missionaries declare how they have all this stuff that they really don't need, right? And when I saw the title for today's lesson, Time to Simplify, I thought of those missionaries. So then one has to ask, where is my focus in life? On the things around me in this world or on the things unseen that are eternal? Perplexing question, huh? I'd like to read Ellen White, Councils on Stewardship, page 209. <clears throat> Many of the people of God are stupefied by the spirit of the world, and are denying their faith by their works. They cultivate a love for money, for houses and lands, until it absorbs the powers of mind and being, and shuts out love for the Creator and for souls for whom Christ died. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. Their eternal interests are made secondary, and brain, bone, <clears throat> and muscle are taxed to the utmost to increase their worldly possessions. All, and all this accumulation of cares and burdens is born in direct violation of the injunction of Christ, who said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. And where are we supposed to lay up our treasure? In heaven. So let me ask you, 
Is there something in this world that absorbs your powers of mind and being? If it, if it, it may be money, houses or land, or automobiles, nobody likes cars, right? Or clothing, or maybe your physical appearance. <clears throat> Perhaps it's just the internet. Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, Netflix, I could go on, right? Or some other bad things on the internet, which I won't even mention here, but people get absorbed in that as well. I've seen a teenager, I've drove, driven a road trip, I've seen a teenager in the back seat of a car spend 10 hours looking at their phone straight, only taking breaks for, for restrooms and food. How? I just been consumed to the point to where they don't even acknowledge if they're being spoken to. So how much of your day or my day is spent in stuff that's related to the world? In the end, is there any room or time left for God? It is easy to have your foot in both worlds, to cling to whatever worldly stuff may interest you, and to fit some time in for God as well. And I pat myself on the back and I say, I'm doing great, right? But let me ask you this though. Do you think Jesus is coming soon? Sooner than you thought he might be coming. We take a look at the world. We heard the opening for Sabbath. I'm guessing sooner than later, looking at the way the world is. But even if he doesn't, hypothetically, does it seem like more people are passing away these days? I mean, seriously, in the last three years, my wife tells me about somebody, a friend or somebody she knows about every three to four months that passed away. This used to be like an every other year thing. And now it seems to be kind of commonplace. So even if Jesus doesn't come, what happens if we fall asleep beforehand? And if we are still steeped in the world, and all that stuff? Or are we steeped in the Lord? Let's read what happens to all that stuff. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for the hastening, the, com uh, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and that's the atmosphere, and the elements will melt with intense heat. So if it's all eventually going to go up in smoke anyway, how precious is it really? And how much of our day do we spend on these earthly things? How much time could we be spending with God? I want to read something from um, Ellen White, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 554. Giving all every day. <clears throat> By taking one step after another, the highest ascent may be climbed and the summit of the mount may be reached at last. Do not become overwhelmed with the great amount of work that you must do in your lifetime, for you are not required to do it all at once. Let every power of your being go to each day's work. Improve each precious opportunity. Appreciate the helps that God gives you and make advancement up the ladder of progress step by step. Remember that you are to live but one day at a time, <clears throat> that God has given you one day, and heavenly records will show how you have valued its privileges and opportunities. May you so improve every day given you of God that at last you may hear the master say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's Matthew 25, 21. Our character is, is a daily process to build it, that we need to have every power of our being to invest into it, so that we may be good and faithful servants in God's eyes. Heaven, hopefully, is our desired destination, to be heavenly citizens, right? Citizen is an odd thing, though. 
on earth, we can be a citizen of the United States. But on earth, I can have dual citizenship. I can be a citizen of the U.S. and, say, Portugal or Spain or the U.K., for instance. But to be a heavenly citizen, you can only belong to one country, to one ruler, and to one king. Philippians 3, 18 through 21 says, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Philippians there just tells me that if we set our minds on earthly things, we are an enemy of the cross of Christ. Those are harsh words, aren't they? But if we have our eyes on the prize, on Christ Jesus, we will know the joys that the king of the universe has prepared for us. Now, I'm not telling you to sell everything that you own or anything like that. What I am saying is that we are to not let the world distract us from what really matters. And that is daily building a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may have or that we may be the five wise virgins invited to the wedding feast at his coming. Mark, can yep. you tell us about Wednesday priorities? Priorities. I love how you said that. Daily building a daily relationship with Christ. We right? need that. You know, character to prepare a character for heaven takes a lifetime. Right, man. And it, you need to do it every day. And it's a step-by-step -step process. It's a well, yeah. gradual thing. It's not God like we, we can't have this big step function. It's just a gradual right. step. And God happens. doesn't snap his fingers and transform you. Right. He transforms you day by day, but little by little. Right. And that helps to keep you worry about. You know, it helps to keep the worry away. If you can just say, well, if I just improve just a little bit. I don't have to be right. all the way up here right away. Yeah. It's just one step of a time. I don't need I really the accelerated like course. <laughs> I like that idea. And we're going to learn about priorities today. And, and really from the very beginning, um, we know that you really, and at the end, we're going to have to make a choice. Um, we can't be halfway with God. We are going to have to be fully with him or not with him. And in fact, this isn't new. In fact, in the Old Testament, we read this way back in Deuteronomy, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, when Moses talked to the Israelites, Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall, you shall talk to them when they sit in your house and when they walk by the way when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be frontlets be between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and all your gates. Only God. In the in New Testament, during Jesus' parables, he says much the same thing. He recites this, Mark 12, verses 30. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. In fact, to another parable, the parable of the shrewd manager, uh, Jesus concludes that one by saying very, very succinctly, you got to choose your priority. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon in this eye, in this case, is the world. It's things of the world. It's money. It's the, the objects in the world. Or you can figure out and love God. Why is God saying? Why is he so adamant? We, we went through these things. Why is he so adamant on this? To be focused only on him. 
And I really say is because I really, can, I really understand that God knows that this is tough. This isn't easy. This is tough. Um, and so the things that Byron was talking about, the step-by-step things of building that relationship with God will help us to get through that. But let's read on and, and what he talks about in this lesson on priorities. In 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, another kind of warning or identification of, of, of God telling us that we need to be focused. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. He who does not, who does the will of God, abides forever. Idea, I mean, this is the subtle thing of the world, is that you got... You're, you know, what, what feels good to your body, this thing of flesh, what you see with your eyes are these. It's so easy for us to be enticed into what's around us. And this thing about pride of life, you know, even the, you do it, you, you build up some, some wealth and you f- feel proud of yourself. Well, I've done this. Or I've, if David was talking about, well, I have this army that's a million soldiers. I feel okay. No, that's not the case here. In fact, um, it's saying that it's going to be very hard to do this because the things of the world are right here before us every day. The lure of it, all of it is in the world, is strong. The pull of immediate gratification is always there, whispering on our ears or pulling on our short sleeves or both. Hasn't even the most faithful Christian felt some love for the things of the world, even with our knowledge that one day it will all end? We will still feel that pull, don't we? The good news, however is that we don't need to let it pull away from the Lord. I want to read a a really neat verse um, that uh, Mike Mike mentioned it to us, um, and that was why he couldn't be here today, but unfortunately, hopefully things are well for him, but he he pulled this up in in, uh, Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13, that we don't need to let this pull away from the Lord. We don't need the world to do this, and let's read what it says. Light bearers, therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God will help us get through. We need to focus on God and stay with him, step-by-step relationship for, for us to do that. We choose God's. And, but in reality, in the end, all the stuff that's around us, the things of the world, it's going to go away. And that's, that's Wednesday. Should I jump into Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> you can. Because you know what? It, it is all going to burn up someday. Yeah. And it's going to come to nothing. And if we're not careful, eventually we're going to burn up as well. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So Thursday's all about when no one can buy or sell. And, you know, the start of Jesus' ministry, we all know how Peter was called. Let's read about that. Luke 5, verses 10 and 11. Peter and the other disciples and a few others, and let's talk about this. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon Peter. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Do not be afraid, for now on you're going to catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook, forsook all and followed him. They gave up everything. They gave up their livelihood and they followed Jesus. In fact, we know that this is tough times. Uh, Byron talked about it. At the end of time, amazingly, we're going to have to do the same thing. We may have to give up everything for the Lord. We know when we fall asleep, when we pass away, the stuff that we have around us is going to go away. But if it, during the end time, we're going to read a little bit about revelations, there will also be a time where we'll have to choose whether we want to give it all away for God or not, just like Peter did. Let's read up Daniel 12, verses 1, uh, and talk about the end times. And at the time Michael shall stand up, and the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble 
such as never has since there as such as never was there was a nation ever to that time and at that time your people shall be delivered every one who is found written in the book so we know time time of troubles coming we see it around us um, and we're going to read in Revelations about this time of the end. And uh, to do this, um, I studied uh, Renko, I, I recommend Renko Stenonovich's plain Revelation book. I got one right here. I've been reading that. It really helps to decipher this code of Revelations. You know, John is on the island of Papos and having to write a code to get, ri- get through the, the, um, the censure that was happening through the, Ro- the Roman guards. And he really helps to decipher that code. And let's read about the end times, and this idea that we may have to give up everything just like Peter. Revelations chapter 13, verses 11 through 12. And then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and the causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This is, this is going to be Antichrist. And we know it because he has, these, he has horns like a lamb. He's going to look Christ-like, but he's not because he is going to speak like a dragon. He is just like the serpent in, um, during the, serpent, uh, you know, in the, the Garden, of, Garden Eden. of Eden, right? He's going to, we know that it's not, but he's going to be an Antichrist. So how is he going to get us to believe in him? The first thing he's going to do is that the devil is going to try to wow us and deceive us. And let's read in Revelations 13, verses 13 and 15. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who who was wounded by the sword and lived, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast shall both speak and cause as many as would not be worshipped the image of the beast to be ki- killed. So he's going to do these signs, like bringing fire from the earth. I mean, this is right out of the Old Testament, right. you know, and some of the, the, the prophets, uh, allow, God allowing the prophets to do that. And he's going to be like that. But he's also going to bring bring breath into this image of the beast, just like just a lot like God giving breath to man, but he's going to be the Antichrist. Yeah, the counterfeit. The counterfeit. He isn't the true one. So he's going to first try to deceive us, but then if he doesn't deceive us, which is pretty scary because he's so counterfeit. He's, he's, he's you know, it's, uh, you know, he, he's going, these are pretty, you know, he's going to be working his hardest to fake us out. But if he doesn't fake us out, he's going to force us. Revelations verses chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, it says, he causes all, both small and rich, no, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So anybody who has this mark on your hand and your forehead Right. You're, you, what that means is that you have been deceived. You are, you're not on God. You're not following his commandments. Right. Right? And if it's on your forehead, it means you truly believe. If it's on your hand, it's what you do, and you just go along to evade the punishment. Right. So you can buy or sell. Yeah, exactly. But in this case, and so you're allowed to buy and sell, but if you have these hands, you're not allowed, if, if you don't have these marks, you are not allowed to buy or sell. Renko Stavanovich, in Plain Revelations, page 164 and 165, states the following. Revelations 13.7 shows that the climax of the end-time drama includes economic sanctions against those who refer, refuse to worship the beast's image. Refusal to worship the beast will be treated as an act of disloyalty with a penalty of death. However, this scenario will be concluded with the coming of Christ with power and glory. He's going to defeat the satanic triune league and their forces and define his faithful people, bringing them into the eternal homeland. But at the end, we're going to have this choice. 
Buy and selling, if you buy and sell, it's almost like giving up all your goods. Your goods mean nothing to you. You can't sell them right here. You're going to be not in society. You're going to be, have to give everything up. In a sense, it's a little bit like that last little warning. If you have, say, that in order for us to follow God, you have to give up everything. A lot like Peter had to do. That's a warning to us that that's the right path. How do we ensure that, that when we do this, that we aren't missing this last warning, this warning of economic prosperity? The best way to do this is, and it's something that God has taught us from the, from the very beginning, is the mighty principle of tithing. Deuteronomy 24, verses 22, uh, verses 22 and 23. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Tithing is for us, okay? It's a, it allows us to have that constant remembering and, and giving him our first fruits, our first um, incomes, our first grains. It allows us to keep us focused on him and to have trust in the Lord. It's often difficult. You've got bills to pay, things to do, but give him that first tithe. In the end times, we're going to need to stay focused on him. Here's Psalms, verses 31 and 19, another great psalm parallel to what, this tithing concept. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for you, for, who, for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of man. In the end, we have to trust in the Lord that he's going to provide. And in the end times... We're going to have to be prepared to give it all up for him. To follow the lamb wherever he goes. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so, for final thoughts for today, I'd like to read something from Ellen White. It's a little long, but bear with me. <clears throat> Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 472 through 474. As the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. He sees that the popular churches are already lulled to sleep by his deceptive power. He, uh, by pleasing sophistry and lying wonders, he can continue to hold them under his control. Therefore, he directs his angels to lay their snares especially for those who are looking for the second advent of Christ and endeavoring to keep all the commandments of God. We kind of have to do that if we want to go meet him. Amen. Says the great deceiver, we must watch those who are calling the attention of the people to the Sabbath of Jehovah. They will lead many to see the claims of the law of God. And the same light which reveals the true Sabbath reveals also the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and shows that the last work of man's salvation is now going forward. Hold the minds of the people in darkness till the work is ended and we shall secure the world and the church also. Go, make the professors of, or possessors of land and money drunk with the cares of this life Present the world before them in the most attractive light that they may lay up their treasure here and fix their affections on earthly things. We must do our utmost to prevent those who labor in God's cause from obtaining means to use against us. Keep the money in our, rank, our own ranks. This is Satan talking. Yeah. The, the more means they obtain the more they will injure our kingdom by taking from us our subjects, and other Satan's subjects, make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truth we hate. 
we need not fear their influence, for we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power. Now, there's a power of evil, and will finally be separated from God's people. This is what Satan has planned for each one of us. And whether by trials or perils in tough times, or by keeping us consumed in the things of this world, or presenting worldly things here as the best that we will ever see and know. Remember when Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor? That's the same illusion he tries to sell us. It doesn't get any better than this. But ultimately, he really just wants you to be in the lake of fire with him. He knows that he lost the war. And now the only thing that he can do to hurt God is to cause those that Christ came to save to be lost. Mm. Don't be a casualty of this war. Let us all cling to Jesus each and every day of our lives that we might hold fast and trust in the one who is mighty to save. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, teach us, guide us to put aside the things of this world, Lord, to focus on you. Lord, it's a day-by-day -day process. And Lord, each and every day we may stumble, but we look to you, Lord, we beseech you to guide us, to pick us up, Lord, to put us back on our feet, and to help us on our way. We already said earlier, you are, you are the branch that feeds us, Lord. Or you are the source of all that we are. Anything good at least. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us each and every day. That we might draw closer to you, Lord. That we might learn your ways. And that we might unlearn the world. Let us not be consumed by the things of this world, Lord, but to be in your presence each and every day that we might come to know you as a Savior, as a brother, and as a friend, Lord. Someone that we can turn to in all things. Lord, you did it all at the cross. Help us to ponder your sacrifice that you made for each one of us and the price, the infinite price that you paid for us all, that we may surrender to you and let this world be so that, Lord, when you do come, whether we're asleep in the grave or waiting for you, that we may go home with you forevermore. We thank you, Lord, and pray all this to your Father in heaven through our Redeemer and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.